All right. So let's start. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. So a great pleasure to see uh, such a well attended uh, audience. I had warned Manuel a little bit about uh, you know, his consistent attendance. <laughs> and, uh, you know, after things have been started in person, there have to be proven wrong. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to have uh, an old friend from here. Uh, so very good for the introduction. Uh, Manuel did his undergrad in Marburg. Uh, where they both do viruses and vaccines. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then after that, he did his PhD uh, with Manuel Block at, uh, in the, at Max Planck Institute in, in Darking and then in Munich. Uh, work actually built the first generation quantum gas microchip experiment, so as to be uh, noticeable. And then he moved to the US, went to Harvard, worked with Misha Lukin and, and Vladimir Bulitic. Uh, and there we started these uh, uh, defective, uh, defective with arrays. And since 2016, uh, started his lab at Caltech, uh, working on uh, alkaline earth atoms and uh, tweezers, because it's a very beautiful streak of, of, of result, which uh, we're going to, uh, to hear about today. So, Manuel, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for coming. Is it on? Very good. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here, pleasure to see a lot of people, pleasure to see me. We haven't seen for a long time, but we met when we were like this little, approximately in Les uh doing physics and other things. Um, okay, so let me let me get going. So I'll tell a little story about uh, how we can use tweezer trapped atoms nowadays and control them at the quantum level, entangle them, um, and use them towards applications in, in quantum science. Let me start very broadly um, with a brief overview. So quantum science, you can think of, you know, defined by experimental systems, and there's a wide variety from, you know, how does it work? Solid state systems to phosonic systems, superconducting qubits, which have some of the origins here. And our research um, broadly placed is, is in cold atomic systems, specifically neutral atoms. I always find it fascinating that in that field, um, despite some sort of the a variety of experimental systems, there's like a more or less a uh, common set of goals that, that can be thought of. So a lot of us want to build quantum computers. That's something also I'm interested in. I'm uh, particularly also interested in maybe a sub-branch of quantum computing, if you will, so-called quantum simulations, which is to study quantum anybody systems in a very controlled fashion. Um, I'm also interested in quantum metrology, where atomic systems have some sort of their origin to a certain degree, which is to use uh, quantum states, uh, systems for precision measurement, in particular also including entanglement. And finally, we might all want to hook up these systems into quantum networks. That's some sort of um, sort of broad set of goals. And some of those goals uh, I'll talk about in my talk. Um, more broadly, uh, I think the goal is here really to outperform the classical counterparts. If you want to build a computer that's better than a classical computer. And I think for most of those goals, I would say the key ingredient is in the end to build up large scale entanglement, to be able to build it up and maintain it, maybe with or without error correction. But I want to briefly illustrate uh, why, why this is actually so challenging. So why don't we have systems where we say we have, say, macroscopic superposition states of whatever, 500 qubits or something. Like that. So why is it actually so difficult? So imagine you start with an array. Uh, say of, of of qubits or atoms, it doesn't really matter which system, and they're all in the ground state. So they're two level systems, and you try to entangle them step by step. So you try to entangle. Them. Yeah. So where are we? Okay, I tried to explain why it's difficult to entangle a large scale system. So you can imagine, you know, uh, a set of qubits, and then you try to entangle them, so sort of piece by piece. So let me kind of illustrate that. No, this guy doesn't work anymore. Hey, yeah, yeah, what's this going on? What happened? First, we have to. Good, good. Okay, now we made our first uh, two qubit gate. Yes, yeah, so and it created an entangled state between the two middle atoms, which is a superposition between them being up and down. Okay. So I'm trying to grow basically entanglement in that system. If I only had pairwise interactions, if you think about it more deeply, um, trying to build states that have more and more complicated superposition states uh, in short range interacting systems, this forms some sort of a light cone, if you think about it. And that means that um, if you want to grow something that has a lot of entanglement, it takes you a longer time, the larger your system is, if you just do it purely on unitary operations. Yeah. 
Um, but at the same time, the more qubits you have, the more chance for errors you have as well. So, so there's some sort of a competition where you try to scale up, where you kind of got hit, get hit twice more or less. So once it actually takes you a lot of time to build up entanglement, and at the same time, you also increase your error rate effectively. And I'll come back to this later in some sort of a relatively simple setting where we will see that. So there's a first problem here, which is I want to grow entanglement, and at the same time, I have to keep my error rate low. You could say maybe I can solve it with error correction, but I think it's somewhat similar in a sense, where I have to keep up entanglement while not making too many errors at the same time. Okay. Another one is uh, some sort of conceptual problem or like engineering problem, I'll say, where we try to scale up these systems. I need a lot of qubits, but also control them individually at the same time. And that's, that's technically just hard to do an experiment. And finally, I need to be able to benchmark this system. So how do I actually know what I did? Okay, maybe some calculations have simple outputs, but maybe I have some intermediate steps or so many body simulations where it's actually not so obvious if I did the right thing in the experiment, okay? And I'll talk about a little bit how we try to address some of these challenges with tweezer trap atoms in this talk, okay? Let me kind of give you a brief outline. I'll give an intro to tweezer arrays and rootback interactions will be relatively broad. I hope everyone can follow that part still. Then show what we call some single and two qubit results and talk very briefly about tweezer clocks since I mentioned it to some people in the discussions. Um, then I, I'll switch gears and talk about a result from many body physics uh, that has to do with the emergence of so-called random state ensembles. I hope you can still get at least the gist of that. And then finally, I'll show how we can use that result to actually benchmark uh, very large scale entangled systems. And in that, uh, in that talk, I'll talk about systems with up to 60 qubits that uh, have, uh, you know, in a sense, maximum entanglement that we can build up in there. And we'll also talk about a comparison of, of what we can do in experiment, and so sort of the power of classical computers. So this will be some sort of the last one. Okay, let me jump uh, right into it and, and, and talk a little bit about the experimental uh, basics there. So what are optical tweezers? So optical tweezers are very tightly focused laser beams. You take a high resolution objective and then focus that into a, a vacuum chamber. And typically it's a micron scale. And then there's some early results actually from from Paris, uh, where they showed that you can trap single atoms in, in these tweezers, basically, that you load out of a background gas one, one way or another, okay? The details of how you load them doesn't matter so much. Um, what we are working on in our labs are then large-scale tweezer arrays. So we, we don't want just one tweezer, but many of them, and there's two different techniques to do that. One is so-called spatial light modulators, and one is called acousto-optical deflectors that I will briefly, uh, briefly want to explain. So what happens here is you come in with one laser beam, and this laser beam, you can basically split into many beams by shining in an RF frequency on this deflector device. This is basically a crystal with a traveling wave. And then the deflection angle is controlled by the frequency of that RF wave. It basically creates a modulation in the refractive index. It's just scattering, essentially. And then depending on this RF frequency, you can basically uh, tune the angle of what comes out. So now if you shine in multiple RF frequencies, you basically get multiple beams out. And that's what's happening here. So essentially, you shine in some sort of an RF frequency comp. And then with each uh, tooth in that comb, you can control the intensity and the deflection angle of one of those beams. Okay, so that's boils down then to RF control. You can cross these devices then also to cross, uh, to create 2D arrays, okay? And this is a, a picture of the optical field, it's not atoms yet, of a 2D tweezer array with 10,000 tweezers. So in terms of the optical engineering itself, this is relatively scalable, okay? Um, let me jump right into the physics here. So uh, what I'm showing here on the left side is you stick these tweezer arrays into a so-called magneto-optical trap. It's some sort of a cold atom reservoir, you can think of it. And then you try to load them, okay? And then you disperse the background atomic gas and you take a fluorescence image of the remaining tweezer array. And that's one of those shots. And then you throw everything away and repeat the whole process. You load some kind of gas, try to load the tweezer array, let the gas disperse and take an image. And I'm gonna show you a video where you see repeated images of that, okay, see that? So this is an underlying uh, square array here. It's a little bit tilted with respect to this, but it doesn't matter. So there's an underlying square array, but what you see is that in each of these shots, not all of the tweezers are full, okay? So sometimes you have an atom in there and sometimes you have no atom. There's some process, I don't wanna go into details, that prevents you from having two atoms. So this, we know we don't have it. There's a collisional process. But sometimes you have one atom, sometimes you have not. So it's a stochastic loading process. And um, this can be okay for some applications, but if I wanna do something super controlled, I want an ordered array. I want an ordered set of qubits, an ordered set of oscillators that I can work with. So how do I do that? So how do I really get a defect-free array now out of the stochastic loading process? So basically atoms go in and out. Um, 
And this is the idea for the so-called atom by atom assembly scheme. It's a relatively simple idea. Practical implementation can be tricky sometimes, but let me just explain the idea. So you have one of those arrays, and I imagine you make them with one of these acoustic optical deflectors. That's the simplest scheme. Um, and then I see one of these fluorescence images. And if I have very high imaging fidelity, I can identify which of the tweezers are full and which of them are empty. Okay. If I know that, I can feed back onto my RF frequencies and I can basically switch off the empty tweezers. So it would be my first step. I just switch off the empty ones. And if I can do this fast enough, it's all good. And now I can rearrange by changing the frequencies into a defect rearrange. So that's some sort of the trick of this atom by atom assembly. There's many schemes of this sort, but the idea is always you make measurements and you feed back fast enough and reshuffle things such that you order them into some sort of a low entropy a system where you know afterwards the occupation number. Okay, and then you can vary, for example, the geometries by changing some sort of the feedback. You can go into pairs or different strings and so forth. Okay, so this is this so-called atom by atom assembly. And by now, this is a technique that's more widely used. So back in the day, you know, we, we, we developed this in, in, in Paris and then there's a parallel paper in, 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 uh, in Harvard, there's a parallel paper in Paris where they did it in 2D. There's various versions of this and we have our own at Caltech. Um, just in terms of the features, it enables you to generate defect-free array of maybe hundreds of atoms in 1D, in 2D, and there's a version that goes into quasi 3D. It means there's several layers, but it's not as extended in the third direction as in the other two. And you can adjust atomic distances between a micrometer and a hundred micrometer. You have flexible geometries. You see various different like lattice structures in here. And uh, practically speaking, it has a much faster repetition rate con compared to traditional cold atom experiments. So additional experiments kind of like what Mir does with his box potentials, you would have to do evaporative cooling and that's a relatively lengthy process. And here the repetition rates, it means how often do I some sort of get a, a, an array to work with the many orders of magnitudes faster basically. Okay, so that's an advantage. There's some limits. So there's a limit in terms of how many traps you can make. It depends on how much laser power you have. So these traps all have to be kind of deep enough and how deep they are depends on how much laser power is in each trap. That means I cannot make infinitely many. And also this rearrangement uh, process, if I really ask for an array that has no defect, it's exponentially suppressed in the sense that each of the atoms I could least identify or I could lose them in the movement or so forth. So each of them has some probability with which I do the rearrangement process correctly. And if I have my total success probability, then scales with P to the N with that single atom probability where I have to have everything right. Image identification, I cannot lose it and so forth. Okay, So these are some sort of the limits. Um, so now I should say these, these experiments are mostly done with so-called alkali atoms that are in the electronic ground state. So these are neutral atoms in the electronic ground state and they are distances larger than a micrometer. So to start with in that configuration, they're basically completely non-interacting. They don't see each other. So the question is how do we really get interactions now in that system, maybe to build up entanglement. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about so-called dipole-dipole interactions that can be induced by going to Wittberg states. You could also think of trapping molecules, which some people do. You could alternatively think about sticking these tweezers into a cavity. There's also some uh, experiments now, uh, and you could think of photon-mediated interactions where you absorb a photon or you emit a photon, reabsorb it. So you could make them talk to each other like that. Or you could think of letting uh, atoms tunnel between tweezers. You could take two tweezers close together and let atoms basically tunnel back and forth, and it would look like some sort of a lattice physics in a, in a solid. Uh, I will not talk about these. I will only focus on some sort of the Rydberg piece for a second. So how does this work? Um, before I go there, let me ask if there are questions. This is a little bit interactive. So, so far, we have atoms and the tweezers. We do reassembly, and they just sit there if you did everything right. OK, no questions. That's good. OK, yeah. Say what? Yeah, that's right. So you cannot keep them forever. There's a heat. Yeah. So the question was if there's a rate at which the atoms heat up and you lose them. And that's right. That's one of the processes that will kill this fidelity. This will kill this probability here. So, so you want as long as possible lifetimes. That's what we call it. So you can lose atoms either by just heating. And it can come, for example, if there are tweezers, they shake or they have intensity fluctuations. Or you can have background collisions with like remaining uh, atoms in your kind of ultra high vacuum, which is high, but not zero pressure, and they can kick you out. So this gives you a finite lifetime. And all of the processes that you do, you have to be much faster than that lifetime. This is sort of the trick. And then depending on which experiment you have, you have different lifetimes. They can range from 10 seconds in the original Harvard experiments to our case, it's 10 minutes, which is actually quite long for a full atom experiment. So it could also go to a cryogenic chamber eventually, and then it could be a day. So that's sort of the scale. Yeah. 
more questions? All right, then let me let me move forward. Okay, root back, root back interaction. So what does it mean? So imagine you have uh, to start with an alkali atom or hydrogen. In the simplest case, we have one valence electron. Okay, and I'm going to talk about the wave function of that outer valence electron for a second. So if if that uh, wave function is in its electronic ground state, the extent of that wave function is very small. It's angstrom level. Essentially. Okay. Now what we do is we excite atoms uh, with a laser into a very high lying electronic state. So it's a principal quantum number and we go very high in the sense that we go up to 70, something like that. And then in that case, uh, this electronic wave function of the outer valence electron can be actually quite large. It can be up to like say 200 nanometers scale. Uh, as a practical consequence of this, um, some sort of the polarizability uh, of that system, so the outer electron with respect to the core, it can be very high. So it's very sensitive to electric fields. You can very easily deform it. And because of that, if you have two atoms that are in this, in this high uh, lying Rydberg states, they can have a very high induced dipole-dipole interaction. So this is so-called van der Waals interaction. And this van der Waals interaction, it turns out, it scales extremely strongly with this principal quantum number. It goes with n to the 11. As we can do the math, and that's how large it is. And then it decays with 1 over R6. So it has a distance dependence. It's a typical induced dipole dipole interaction, as you learn in undergrad or graduate. And, um, and if you go through these numbers, say you take rubidium, and you go through these numbers, you go to n equals 70. So this interaction strength you get from this van der Waals interaction is about 10 gigahertz at two micrometers of one megahertz at 10 micrometers. And it's a very, very strong uh, uh, interaction strength for atomic systems compared to what you typically have, which is more in a kilohertz range. So there's extremely strong interactions you can induce like that. Um, so the bottom line of this is that the interactions are very suited for the typical distances you can have in these, in these systems. You can basically switch them on and off by going to these Rydberg states, back and forth. If they're in a ground state, they don't interact. If you're in the Rydberg state, they can be extremely strongly interacting if you put them close together, or they can be also practically non-interacting if you make the distance larger. That's some sort of the tuning knob you have in terms of the interactions. Okay. Um, any questions about that? Okay, so you basically put electrons into high-lying states, and then you get strong van der Waals interaction. Okay. Yeah. What do you actually do to excite the atoms into this higher? Next, next, next slide. Yeah, I'll talk about this. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. So the way this works is you have these atoms in the tweezer, and I'm going to simplify this a little. I come back to some atomic physics details later. So you have this ground state, and you have the Rydberg state, and you excite them with a laser. Take a laser beam. You shoot it in, excite for the ground to the Rydberg state, and if you hit the resonance correctly, they will go up and down. And I'll show you some results for this later. So that's some sort of the physics. We have the ground state, Rydberg state. In our case, you have a laser beam that excites all of them at once, uh, with, and there's some atomic, you know, uh, difference frequency that's set by the atom, call it mu a. Okay, and some sort of uh, how fast you do this excitation, it's controlled by the strength of your laser. So you, the stronger you make your laser, the faster some sort of the transition rate will be. Okay. Um, this is called Rabi frequency in that case. Let me briefly just show the level diagram of two of these Rydberg atoms. So if you think about two of them now, okay, if you have one, it's just two levels, okay? If you have two of them, there are four levels, both can be in the ground state, one of them can be excited, or both of them can be excited. And the nature of these interactions is such that to some lowest order, uh, these two levels where only one of them is excited or none, they're basically non-interacting, but if both of them are excited, you have this very strong van der Waals interaction, and they get this very strong one over six repulsion at level. That depends on the distance. I'll come back to this level diagram. That's some sort of the logical uh, building block here. Um, so interactions are sent then by the distance, and I can pick the distance by feedback in these tweezer arrays, essentially, by depending on where I place the atoms. Okay. Um, for the experts, you can map this to a spin system, and that's where some of the many-body physics comes from. Um, now, again, there's some sort of a laser detuning, and then there's a laser that I sh show, show in. And you can map, to start with, these two states into spin operators. So you can say there's a projection onto the Rydberg state minus projection on the ground state gives you sigma c. And I can define an x operator. And then in a like, well-defined frame and doing some approximations, it turns out um, that the single atom piece without interactions here, it looks like this. So there's a sigma x rotation that's controlled by the laser intensity. This is this omega here. And then there's a so-called sigma c rotation that is controlled by the detuning. This is in a rotating wave approximation in a rotating frame for the experts. Okay. So it turns out we can just map this onto a spin Hamiltonian. This would be the single atom terms as a sum over i. 
all of these atoms. And then there's an interaction term. And in the interaction term, again, it happens only when you're in the Rydberg state. This is why there's a projector on the Rydberg states. And then there's a distance matrix VIJ, and that distance matrix is set by the distances in the, in the array. So there's a VIJ is some, some coefficient called the C6 coefficient that scales with n to the 11. And then there's the distance uh, one over R6 that you can basically dial in. Okay, that's some sort of the logic. And this is the most bare Hamiltonian you can have in the system. That's some sort of the simplest piece. Um, that happens if you illuminate everything at once. So these parameters are all global. And then you have this interaction strength you can tune in with basically placing atoms different. Okay, is that clear? Any questions? Yeah. Uh, what's the typical on off ratio of this interaction against the system? On off ratio? Maybe? Yeah, as in uh, when you have interaction, engineer interaction on or off. Uh, you mean the suppression? Uh, basically, <laughs> I don't know, 10 to the like much smaller than I care for. I will, let's put it like this. I'm not sure exactly what you mean on off. If, if I have them in a ground or Rydberg state, if the distance is one over six, it's just set by how far you put them apart. So if, if it's say whatever, 10 gigahertz, and then at a, at a micrometer, and then you put a 10 micrometer apart, it's 10 gigahertz divided by 10 to the six. So it would be 10 to the minus five, right? Suppression compared to the high case. I think what's more relevant than the food of physics, and I'll come back to this, is what's the ratio between these parameters and the interaction strength that that, that amounts, whether or not, the system is effectively non-interacting. So if this one is small compared to these guys, it's basically a non-interacting atoms that just rotate around by themselves. And then I can also make this guy much larger than these guys, and then it's very strongly interacting. So the, the key here is that you can tune between something that's very weakly interacting and very strongly interacting by placing atoms at different distances and choosing these parameters in front here by changing laser intensities. Okay, now I'll show some results for these different regimes in a minute, actually. Okay, more questions? All right, okay. Let me, let me kind of move forward. So there's some sort of, uh, this Hamiltonian and variance of this has been used over the years in various different some sort of applications. I'll just want to give you a brief overview of that. So one side uh, of this is what we call quantum simulation of many body physics. So if you look at this Hamiltonian, when it looks like a, like a spin Hamiltonian, you might get in a solid. Right. I mean, it looks like some sort of a transverse field, longitudinal field Isaac model for the many body physics experts. That's essentially what it is with a long range or somewhat long ranges, long ranges tail. And this type of physics has been explored in various like experiments. Uh, and some of these experiments, you would say, okay, they're just quantum magnetism experiments, but some of them are quite tricky in terms of the results. So you can study, for example, phase transitions from disorder to ordered states. So, could be this, uh, this transition between a paramagnet and an endoferromagnet. There's a bunch of results in terms of quantum dynamics. There have been new quantum dynamics results being explored in here by just basically switching on that Hamiltonian suddenly and watching the out of equilibrium dynamics of the system. There's also some uh, nice results in the kind of context of topological physics with some variants of, of this type of physics that you can engineer. But there's a lot of open ground in terms of things you can just engineer using these basic building blocks, uh, conformal field theories, lattice gauge theories, there's particle confinement you could study. And then I'll talk a little bit about quantum chaos in a second. That's some sort of the many body physics of that Hamiltonian you could study. Um, then there's some sort of the more engineered direction where you try to build up things in a more digital fashion potentially. And that comes back to, for example, doing two qubit gate operations or two qubit entanglement. And I'll show you some results for that. But if you just uh, take an alkali atoms, the results until we started, were such that the fidelities of that entanglement, and I'll come back to how we define this specifically on this kind of 97, 98 ish regime. And then there's results also for building macroscopic superposition states. In this case, this is a superposition between everything being up, down, up, down, up, down, and down, up, down, up. So it's a basically a staggered antiferromagnetic order that you create a superposition state. And the record here with these systems is around 20 qubits until the superposition state, you wouldn't call it a GHG state anymore. And that's somewhat compatible to some other platforms like superconductors. You know? So this gives you a flavor of how good or bad these systems are. So this is all nice. So there's a remarkable experimental progress, I think, but we think we've only seen some sort of the tip of the iceberg of this whole story. Okay. Um, there's some limitations, of course. So experimental limitations include the following. Say you just want to apply that Hamiltonian to some initial state. You could have noise in this Hamiltonian, for example. Your Rabi frequency in here could have noise, and this could come from just laser intensity noise. So intensity fluctuates 
will give you some noise parameter in that Hamiltonian. You can have the tuning noise. This comes from phase noise in the laser. You can have positional disorder. In particular, these atoms are not particular not necessarily ground state cooled in the oscillator, so they could have a finite uh, thermal entropy in there. And depending on where they are specifically, you could have a noise on this on this interaction term because the, basically the distance wouldn't be 100% well defined. Okay, that's something that can happen. You could have readout error, preparation error, and more fundamentally, you could have spontaneous emission. Um, so in these in these alkali atoms, usually you actually have to go via so-called two photon transition from this ground. This should be R ground to Rydberg state. And then the Rydberg state itself has a finite lifetime. They typically live for 100 microseconds that you have to compare to the interaction strengths that I showed you. And then you also have to go via this intermediate state that gives you a little bit extra decoherence basically in the system, typically in this, in this accurate. So this is sort of the limits, okay? Um, any questions about that? Good, so let me kind of move forward. So at Caltech, we, we started to ask, okay, can we potentially improve on some of these limits and some of these results using so-called alkaline earth atoms and potentially there are different applications. So what do I mean with this? So alkaline earth atoms are atoms in the second uh, row of the valence, uh, of, the, of the basically periodic system. They have two valence electrons and this two valence electron structure, uh, I'm showing here, for example, for strontium-88, that's the atom we are using. And it gives you a very particular uh, level spectrum. I want to very briefly at least explain that even for the non amo experts. So this gives you a very strange uh, level structure with singlet triplet transitions, where you typically have very, one very broad transition, but then the key feature here is you also have this very, very narrow transition. So typical transitions in alkali atoms, they're few megahertz wide, meaning they have a specific lifetime and a specific uh, radiative lifetime broadening. Here you have these transitions that are nominally dipole forbidden and they can be very, very narrow. So here, this guy, for example, is only seven kilohertz wide. And this guy is, is very, very narrow. I'm not even sure if people know how narrow it is exactly. This is the so-called optical clock transition, okay? It means this excited state, it can live for like 150 seconds, for example. So the key here is that this, this was used in the past for optical clocks. So, so some of the most precise, I think even the most precise atomic clocks in the world, I actually built this strontium using this particular uh, transition, you lock a laser basically to this transition. So it's a very, very, it's a sense it's a very high quality factor oscillator. That's how you can think of that. And uh, what we wanted to do is to exploit some sort of this level structure. So the fact that there's narrow transitions and metastable states uh, in optical tweezer arrays and see if we can make use of that in that context. So that was the idea. Um, and I should say that we borrowed a lot of results from people doing so-called ytterbium quantum gas microscopes, where some of these imaging techniques are borrowed from. And then there's a lot of related results that I don't completely cite in all uh, in all completeness from my friends at, uh, at Chiller, Adam Kaufman and Jeff Thompson at, at, at Princeton, who was a former Yale undergrad. So they have a lot of results in parallel to what I'm gonna talk about. Okay, so we started with this business in 2016 and then had the first results 2018 where we, First, we're able to put these strontium atoms in, in, in tweezers and to image them for the first time at a single atom level. And then for the first time, we could uh, perform so-called sideband cooling. So a lot of people here might have heard about sideband cooling for real. So one of the important factors here is that the seven kilohertz transition, for example, it uh, fully resolves the sideband splitting in these tweezers, meaning the emotional degrees of freedom. So they're typically 100 kilohertz apart, and I have seven kilohertz line width, so I can basically do single photon sideband cooling very, very efficiently. And that's something we see here with this uh, sideband spectrum. Uh, we followed up with a result that showed extremely high imaging fidelity. So that's the accuracy with which I can distinguish a full or an, an empty tweezer. And this fidelity is more than four nines in our case and has to do uh, with various factors of we, how we can construct the imaging and so forth. So this is really quite nice. And I think this is to date a, a record in single atom um, imaging fidelity for neutral atoms. Uh, then we followed up with Rydberg results that I'll talk to you in a second. And we also worked on using this experiment and in turn as an atomic clock. And I'll very briefly mention this in a second. Okay, so let me kind of jump into this Rydberg story for a second. So it's a little uh, interesting. So what you do is here, you start with all atoms in this full ground state here, and then you move them to this metastable state that can live for 100 seconds or longer. Okay? And then for this, uh, after this move, if you just want to do many body physics for a second, you can forget about the other ground state because all the physics happens on kind of megahertz scales. Uh, 
meaning you can do a lot of operations before you would even see this lifetime. So you can basically forget about this. You can think of it as a new ground state. So this has a few, uh, a few features. And then from there, we can go up to Rydberg states you know, directly with a single photon transition instead of this two photon process and alkali atoms. So there's a few features. You have very large Rabi frequencies. You have no extra decoherence from intermediate states. Your atoms are very pulled by sideband cooling. There are new detection schemes that we employ. I don't have a lot of time to talk about this, but we basically detect whether or not we're in the ground or Rydberg state where, via, via auto-ionization. So essentially, this is a strontium atom. It has an iron core, and you can excite the iron core. And if you're in a Rydberg state and you excite the iron core, there's an auto-ionization process that quickly converts you to an iron. And that process you can see because later on, you don't see the iron in the image. So it gives you a way to very quickly distinguish Rydberg states from ground state. And this gives you some sort of a record detection, you know, uh, fidelity here. And then in principle, the Rydberg states are also trappable, but let me, let me skip about this. So let's see some first results for that. So we trap strontium atoms in these tweezers, we move to this metastable state, and then I'm gonna make use of these, these abilities to basically change my interaction strengths at will by placing them at distant, different distances. So what I wanna do first is I wanna put them at distances that are so far away that they're basically non-interacting. So this interaction strengths doesn't matter compared to all the other parameters in this handle toy. Um, and then I wanna um, excite them with this laser beam on resonance, meaning I make this delta very, uh, very small or make it basically zero. And this should give you so-called standard Ravi oscillations. This is what you see. So basically you see the probability um, to be in this, uh, in, in this ground state as a function of time. And you see this oscillate basically in a textbook like Ravi oscillation. And this happens if your spontaneous emission is very low and all of your noise source is very low compared to some sort of the coherent process that gets you back and forth. This answers, I think, one of the questions, how we get up there. And you see, this is almost a textbook-like, so this is very nice. So there's no post-processing done here. This is really raw data. Uh, you can do more in, uh, oscillations here, as you can see, up to 50 or 60 of these oscillations very coherently. And at the time, this was quite nice, because uh, if you look at the results beforehand, they had very, uh, some sort of very limited contrast. And here we can go to a contrast that's really close to one. Uh, and if you really go into numbers, um, so sort of the fidelity at which you can put atoms from here to up here is about 99.5. That's the probability with which I can excite coherently. And this is without correcting for any kind of detection errors or things like this is a really raw fidelity. That's quite nice. And at the time, this was also the single, the first time we saw these Rabi oscillations to Rydberg states, the single alkaline earth atoms. All right. um, let's talk about entanglement for a second. So how can I introduce entanglement the easiest? So what I do now is instead of just having atoms that are widely spaced, I put them in pairs and these pairs I make very, very close such that the interaction strength is extremely strong. It's a so-called Rydberg blockade. So these pairs, they basically form this like four level system I showed you earlier here. And then uh, they're widely spaced such that the pairs don't interact with each other. So within one pair, I have four levels. Again, that's kind of what I showed you. Ground, 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 Rydberg, Rydberg, ground, and Rydberg, Rydberg. And if the atoms are far away, they just show these kind of standard Rabi oscillations. But now if I go close together, as I showed earlier, this Rydberg branch is pushed out of resonance, basically. That means if my laser is not very broad, I would never excite that state. So I'm stay, staying up here, I'm exciting up here, but I cannot go here, this is blockaded out. That's sort of the physics. And I'm, if you think about that physics more carefully, what happens is actually that you excite from this ground state to a superposition state here. So this has to do with the symmetry of the Hamiltonian. So you excite to a superposition state where you do not know which of them has been excited. So it's a superposition of ground Rydberg plus Rydberg ground. Okay. And you should also see a so-called square root of two enhancement compared to this normal Rabi frequency I just showed you. This process, if you do that, should be square root of two faster. And indeed, we see this in experiment. I'm not showing exactly, but it's exactly square root of two faster. You can do some kind of processing such that you know, you, okay, you basically see that you don't excite up here. And you again see these type of oscillations in these pairs with very, very high contrast. Okay, so there's also a key here. Um, you can do a little bit of uh, more oscillations. So I go for 60 times here, and you can do a little bit of processing and basically checking these oscillations very carefully. And from this, you can um, uh, reconstruct the lower bound for the fidelity with which you go to this bell state, basically. This would be the experimental state, the overlap with this target state that I have. And that fidelity, I can lower bound and it's higher than 99 something. Whatever the something is, we're still debating internally, but we have a lower bound in the paper. And we believe it's actually 99.8. So that's the entanglement fidelity that we have in experiment. 
And this is an important building block because at the time, this was some sort of limited to 97, 98, and we are now in this 99 something regime that I think is pretty important for future applications in our simulation information and quantum metrology. Okay, good. So these are some sort of the results we have just in that manifold where we have an encoding that's in the ground and the Rydberg state. And uh, there can generate entanglement with very high fidelity. I see these Rabi oscillations. Um, and I want to ask if you have questions about that before I move forward. Yeah. How do you get the fantastic timing resolution uh, in the Rabi plot? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> the question is how we get the timing resolution. Um, there's actually not that good a timing resolution. Yeah. So the tricky part is that this is actually quite fast if you look carefully, it's kind of megahertz range. And if you have ever tried to switch optical beams that fast, usually do it with an acoustic optical modulator and that's kind of tight. And it turns out it is relatively tight, but you have to just be very good in controlling your pulse area. So there's a switch on time. And that switch on time is a fraction, some sort of, of the Rabi oscillation time. And then you just have to control your pulse area very carefully. However, that switch on time is a little tricky. We don't like it. For some of the experiments we want to do, and I'm going to show you it actually limiting factor. And now we're switching to electro-optical modulators right now. So we're trying to make that switch. It should be a lot faster. They have their issues, but it's some sort of uh, not obvious how to control elect, uh, optical fields that fast. Yeah. What is the switch on time? Um, in this case, I think it's a, a 20th of, of the Rabi oscillation you can control. Okay, so you have five megahertz, one over five megahertz, and another 20. So it's relatively fast, but it still matters for some of the things I'm gonna, gonna show you. Actually. Yeah. What's the damping rate of oscillation? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, so the ask question, what's the damping rate of this oscillation? It comes back to a conversation we had this morning. So what's actually the noise in here? So what's what's limiting here? And it turns out uh, it's so much, at short time, you might see spontaneous emission and so on, but this long time decay is just intensity noise of the laser actually. And that that's, comes back to that question. It's extremely hard to control intensity noise uh, on that fast time scale. And, and, and additionally, it's fully correlated with some of the discussion. So this is, Ramsey would be better than the It could be, yeah, right, right. Yeah. And, and here, this is fully correlated. So, so we can, for example, look at correlation matrices between the atoms. So we know uh, some sort of that uh, the intensity noise that we have is completely common mode to all of the atoms. And this you can check via some sort of additional post, post processing action. Yeah, no questions? Good. All right, good. Let me, let me move forward, like uh, do a little bit of metrology. Let me kind of very briefly talk about clock transition control since a few people ask me about sensing and, and, and metrology things. So I didn't really tell you yet how we get from this ground to this metastable state. So this is, as I mentioned, this ultra narrow transition. So you have to learn how to control that transition. And we actually go in a co coherent fashion also from this ground to this metastable state. And it's this 698 nanometer clock transition. And you have some results, you can do that. For the expert strontium-88, this transition is actually not allowed. So you have to apply a really, really high magnetic field to make, make it even a little bit allowed. And then you can drive these, these types of oscillations. So these oscillations would be many, many orders of magnitude lower. So you also need an extremely uh, narrow clock laser. That's what it's called. But we have been, um, so you can do this, say, with 99% fidelity or something like this. So you have to fight additional decoherence mechanisms. But we have been asking somewhat of a different question as a side note, and I'll come back to this. Um, so what's some sort of the minimal line width you can achieve in here? And maybe you can even build a clock out of it. And then we did that, I just only have one slide for that. So what you can do is basically um, take a very, very narrow clock laser that you shoot in here. And then basically you probe that transition and you can basically then by looking at this Rabi oscillation, for example, tell if you're on resonance or not. So if you're off resonance, you wouldn't excite them as much. If you're on resonance, they would excite. So you can basically use that information then together. You basically read it out via signal atom fluorescence detection. You can check uh, which of the states I'm in and then feedback uh, onto this clock laser, basically to build what is called an optical clock. An optical clock is nothing else than some sort of a local oscillator that might have some slow drift. And you basically check the slow drift whether via reference, the reference by your atoms. And you need to do feedback. Okay, so this is what we achieved here. Um, this is in parallel with, with some results from Adam Kaufman, but I want to highlight this graph specifically. This is some sort of uh, so called error signal. So you probe this basically transition a little bit left and right of the, of the transition and then subtract, and then you get an error signal. 
um, depending on where you are with respect to the transition. And we do this here with 80 atoms. And you see the x-axis is, is Hertz level. here. So this means we can resolve these ultra narrow transitions at the Hertz level in these tweezers. And we can, in the same time, have single atom with control and single atom readout. And it's relatively unique. It's some sort of a marriage of uh, precision uh, measurement. So why do I call this precision measurement? Because it's an optical transition. So this thing has like multiple hundreds of terahertz and we can measure it at a Hertz level. That's not something new. People have done this in optical lattice clocks or in ions. But here we have some sort of an intermediate system where we have hundreds of these atoms potentially here it's 80, but there's no reason why it couldn't go to hundreds or thousands. Where at the same time, I really have some sort of programmable control in there. So I can move atoms around and I could potentially entangle them. So it's some sort of a precision measurement apparatus that has elements of like quantum information kind of built into it, which is relatively unique. And I think this kind of uh, marriage, I think will be uh, something I think pretty fruitful in upcoming years. I think it's not the only system that people will really think about these things very hard. So in the end, the idea is that, okay, you have this, this, this Rydberg control from this ground or Rydberg state where you can do maybe many body physics or quantum simulation. Then you have additional, um, clock transitions, some sort of, that you can control at this kind of Hertz level potentially. And then in the end, you could really kind of merge these things where you could think of, okay, and maybe have this ground to clock transitions and after the Rydberg transition, I can use this transition, for example, to mediate entanglement down here in this, in this level. Okay, you could also have certain nuclear spins in there and so on, but that's some sort of the platform you can have. And again, then here you can do, you know, many body physics potentially, here you can just think of clock physics by itself and try to be competitive. And here you could think of things kind of mixed up in terms of like building computing platforms or also using entanglement to potentially enhance your sensing, you know, capability for doing this, this feedback onto the clock laser. Okay. So this is some sort of the, the platform overlay. So how much time do we have? Not much really. I think we lost five, 10, seven minutes. Okay. Well, okay. Let me let me ask you a question for that. We're going to switch gears for a second. Do so many body physics for real. Okay, you're still with me? Okay, so you're ready for some quantum chaos in a second? Okay, let's do a little bit of quantum chaos. Okay, so there's a lot of progress to be done here. You know, you can do single side rotations and so on and do programmable clocks, but let's do something else for a second. I wanna ask you a different question is how, in the beginning, um, I talked about, you know, this kind of framework where I try to get like very large scale entangled states. So how do I actually know I, I generated a state like this if I, if I did generate? And I wanna come back to this benchmarking question. So what I wanna know is, okay, in theory, I wanna do something specific, produce a certain target state that is pure, but in experiment, I'm gonna have errors because I'm gonna get some mixed state, okay? And I maybe imagine I'm targeted a very, very highly entangled large scale state. How would I know I did the right thing? Okay, what I wanna measure is the so-called state overlap. So I wanna measure the fidelity overlap, which is the overlap of this target state with what I did in experiment. Um, and generically, this is very hard, you might think, because I might have to reconstruct the experimental state. And that's, that's some sort of exponentially hard in the system size because there are too many parameters in these highly entangled states. But however, it's some sort of, in most systems, you can think of this fidelity just as the probability of having made no errors in the experiments. Essentially, I just wanna do something in the experiment and, and keep track of how many errors I made, basically. And that's some sort of what you have to do. And you can actually do this, and it turns out using some sort of insights into quantum chaos, you can think about this, okay, maybe I made an error, and if I have chaos, this error will be mapped by a butterfly effect or something like this, this is sort of the rough idea, okay? So let me kind of walk you through that. That's some sort of the basic idea. So you have the theory, you have the experimental output, and you want to measure that thing. And then all we do in the experiment, I'll show you this in a second, we just read out in a single basis all of these qubits, we have many of them. And then you check uh, what's the probability to uh, find a certain outcome. So what are the outcomes here? So all of them could be up, all of them could be up, one could be down, they could be up, down. So there are two to the n possible outcomes. There are certain probabilities for these outcomes. And this is some sort of what's plotted here. There's some sort of a histogram you get for all of the outcomes you can get in a single measurement basis. And now it turns out if your system is necessarily chaotic enough, if you had a single error in here, this probability distribution is completely changed. It's changed such that it completely loses its correlations. So that like you would see by just checking this one versus this one, did I make an error or not? Okay. And this is some sort of the basic idea here is that if you have this bit string correlation, so you basically correlate these two, if you do this in the right way, it will give you the fidelity. The logic, okay? And this has been done before, so there's nothing completely new. This is done in the so-called linear cross entropy. You might have heard of that. That's the quantity used in Google's quantum supremacy test to benchmark their platform. So this is their claim. 
So they do this bit string correlations and then claim, okay, they have a certain fidelity. And then with that fidelity, you can go into all kinds of philosophical arguments, but that's some sort of the, the basis there. And this cross entropy, if you look at it carefully, and once you read these papers again, one day, um, it's nothing but a probability distribution for certain outcomes and it's just a correlator. So this is this correlation function and it's kind of normalized in a specific way. It's done such that it gives you the fidelity back under certain theoretical assumptions. Um, these assumptions, um, they have to do with the fact that they use so-called random circuits. So they kind of build in quantum chaos by hand into the system. So basically randomize the full evolution and there's certain mathematical theorems that then tell you that if you do the right thing, uh, this function, this, is, this, this relationship is correct. And this is a uh, right thing that you need in there is a so-called random state ensemble. Um, that means that you take a certain input state and your output state is fully randomized in the in the Hilbert space. That's what it's what it means. Um, so what are these? How much time do I have? I have to be five minutes. Okay, now I have to actually hurry up. So, okay, so maybe just give you a brief flavor. So it's like, what are random state ensembles, and how do we get them in experiment? And I want to do benchmarking for the last five minutes. Just give you like a flavor of what is needed in these Google experiments. That's also what we need in our experiments to do the fidelity. It's an interesting concept. I want to do at least one slide. So uh, what is that? So a random state ensemble is a set of state that uniformly covers the Hilbert space in very simple terms. What it means is some sort of, you have state psi and they're labeled psi. Everyone should understand that the AMAO or not, it's just basic quantum physics. You have these states and they should uniformly cover the Hilbert space. So how, how do I think about this? Imagine you have one input state and you have a device, you can fully randomize the output basically. And think of a single input state as like randomized benchmarking in a sense. You have a single input state and what you want to do is, uh, have a unitary that basically puts you on the block sphere everywhere, okay? It doesn't necessarily mean that these states are orthogonal. Some of them are not orthogonal. You might have a very small angle, but you want to uniformly cover the block sphere. Okay? This is some sort of a small set of Hilbert space. And um, you can think if this is just statistical mechanics, it's not, there's some sort of a lowest order moment you can think of in statistical mechanics. I want to skip of that. The key fact here is that, um, you can analyze the fluctuations in here. And there's some sort of universal relationships in that fluctuations that you only know about if you keep track of this full distribution to a certain degree. So you could go ahead and take all of these states and average them. This would give you some sort of the mixed state. That's just the average over all of these states. But these things, they wouldn't tell you about the fluctuations. And the fluctuations are kind of the key for all of this benchmarking stuff. That's kind of maybe all I want to say here. Okay, let me kind of uh, skip this a little bit. Uh, it take a little bit. So, so, so sort of the idea here is that you can keep track of these projective measurement results, say for a given output. Say you can take a single qubit and you check the probability to find that single qubit in the up state as a function of the setting that you have in your program, as a function of the label J for the state. And you plot that probability with this. So you get these kind of some sort of bit string type histograms. But now, um, some sort of, if you think about the full counting statistics, so what's the probability that this probability finds into a certain bin? It's the probabilities of probabilities. Do you know what it is? So you think about like a, a block sphere and you think from the side and you think about like, how often do you find the projection on the C axis into a certain bin? Do you know, do you know how this looks like if it's fully random? Anyone knows the distribution function? Okay. Huh? Yeah, it's a cosine, it's, that's a good one. The cosine is if you do a Rabi oscillation. That's right, that's, that's, a, that's a simple case. If you just do a Rabi oscillation, it's a cosine. But here you have all of them, it's a, it's a spherical. The width distribution is a completely flat distribution, actually. Just for the, where is it? No, no, it doesn't go. It's completely flat, very strange distribution. You shouldn't see very often, actually. So it's a really flat, completely flat distribution. And it's basically has a very strong, it's very broad and that's sometimes called anti-concentration. So the mean is one half basically in this case and then it's completely flat, that's what it should be. And if you have an error, it turns out it's extremely sensitive. This is maybe the one thing I wanna say about this is that if you have an error in the system, you have many errors in the average, you should get mixed states. And then if you look from the side on the block sphere and you have mixed states and they're shorter and you project them, the distribution should get uh, maybe more peaked in the center, actually. So that's some sort of the logic. So you get this kind of peaks, and these peaks are sometimes called concentration. This is nomenclature and it's like benchmarking, you know, business. So this decoherence leads to concentration, and if you have randomized device, uh, it should look to something like broad. So then you can do this in a very large Hilbert space. It gets quite complicated. It actually gets a little easier if it's very large. So you have like many, many different measurement outcomes, but if you fix one and you plot against as a function of the label and you do the histogram, 
And if, uh, say, it's a random circuit, does anyone know it? Maybe some people know that. The so called, okay, so called Porter Thomas distribution. It's an exponential distribution, that, as it turns out. So there's some sort of exponential thing that goes down. It's also sometimes called anti concentration. And again, if you have an error, you should get something very peaked. Um, so this is this kind of distribution function. And sometimes these things are called speckle pattern. If you see in a talk by uh, Martinez, for example, he likes to call this speckle pattern. Okay. All right. Let me kind of say one thing like, do you see this now in a, just a generic quantum chaos experiment? So these are all randomized experiments. And what we do is a little different. So what we do is we just have one Hamiltonian. Just have one Hamiltonian. I don't randomize anything by hand. And I just let the system run under one Hamiltonian for different evolution times. And when I just ask about some very, very simple question, I have a given Hamiltonian, a given input state, and I give you the output states at different times. Does this look like it's randomly distributed or not? Okay, like if you think hard for five minutes, you should know the answer already that it's not, but let me just still show you that for a second. It's a little bit surprising. So you think about this thing just going through the Hilbert space. And then I want to ask, um, okay, so I'm sampling from different times. So do I see something that resembles this, this, uh, this quantum, you know, this is basically random distribution and I measure in a different basis. So again, so what I do is I basically look for the probability to find a different bit string at a different time and I have many different bit strings. I'm only showing like three of them. There's two to the end. So that's very complicated readout that you need to do uh, as a function of time. But you see is something a little funky. So like, okay, each of them, they fluctuate quite a bit in the beginning and then they die out. The fluctuation. So this experimental data, short time or intermediate time and late time, this is a coherent sub, uh, simulation is the dashed line in the background. So it keeps on doing. And if I simulate the system with errors, it dies out. Okay, so something is happening. So now I can do these histograms. So I do histograms at an intermediate time for all of those guys. And it turns out there's a pretty clear exponential distribution. Actually, It's actually not obvious that it should be. So we very clearly see this uh, Porter Thomas. So it's a relatively large, large Hilbert space. The dimension is like a few hundred. It's not super large, but okay. So. So we see this exponential distribution and that's a purely coherent effect. And at late times, basically you see that you had errors. So now at late times, you see this kind of concentration. It's not obvious that it should do that. And it turns out um, our theory understanding is that, and I'll come back to this in a second, that pretty much any chaotic system should show that. And it's actually not obvious that this is the case. Uh, why is this not obvious? Because if you just do a state evolution with a given Hamiltonian, uh, you have some sort of a fixed basis that's the energy basis. Think of a, uh, as a qubit system. You guess the distribution, right? If you have a qubit system and you just drive it, you just go like this. And it turns out the distribution wouldn't be completely Porter Thomas, actually, because you're just driving around this axis, but not all others. So there's some sort of axis missing. But it turns out there's some sort of a theory you can write down for this. And it turns out this is not a random state ensemble, but something we call random phase ensemble. There's some sort of fixed axis, but you're just randomizing evolution phases. And that's something you can do mathematically correct. And we did all of that. And it turns out there's two measurement, two outcomes for this. One is you get, if you do it right, still a Porter Thomas distribution for large dimensions. And that should be very, very universal. So there should be any Hamiltonian that has some sort of uh, ergodic physics in it um, should actually show that. So actually a signature of ergodicity in a sense. And at the same time, if you do it right, you should actually get this benchmarking story back. Um, that's that. There's another way of doing this. I'm going to skip this. I want to show you the last two minutes. If I get two minutes, I get two minutes. Okay, get two minutes. Okay. Right. I go on. You just have to leave at some point. <laughs> okay. So let me just like like briefly summarize this. There's some sort of a logic behind this. If you have a, a system that's ergodic in a very specific sense, I can tell you it's a many-body system that you would call ergodic. It would actually show that. It would show these kind of ensembles. So this the output, if I sample it in a specific way, would be randomly distributed in a very specific sense. It's a maximally entropic distribution up to certain constraints. So, so if I have a fixed Hamiltonian, I have a certain constraint, I have a certain energy eigenbasis, and I can only randomize phases, but the phases will be as random as possible. I can put other constraints that I want, but it turns out generically, the system will be as entropic as possible given the constraints. And it's almost like StatMec, but it's not quite StatMec. So in StatMec, you usually talk about orthogonal states only. You talk about energy eigenstates and some sort of entropic distribution over orthogonal, say, energy eigenstates. Here it's entropic in a state of state space where the states are not not orthogonal anymore and the states are labeled so i can tell you okay i give you a label and then the guy plans like this so sort of is a different type of thinking about entropy and it turns out in this case uh, statmec kind of falls out as some sort of the lowest order 
So the lowest order business of this is you get that back step neck, you get the Gibbs distributions and all that, but you can go order by order actually higher and really think of things to be kind of more continuously distributed in the Hilbert space. And there are then uh, consequences of this that are observable, that's my point. So you have this, this Porter Thomas distribution I showed as one observable consequence. And the other observable consequence is that you can actually do fidelity measurements. And this is some sort of this butterfly effect story that I, that I told you. So you can now use this to do fidelity estimations. And we do this, for example, in these kind of experiments that I just showed you. You can basically compare some sort of the probabilities of your experiment and the target state with a specific correlator that's a little more complicated than this Google correlator because you have to put in some knowledge about the agudicity and so on without going into details. It's again a correlator and a claim it's a fidelity for quench dynamics with certain Hamiltonians and you can cross check it. And okay, we see this in experiment. You see here this fidelity decay as a function of time and entanglement bind up and we do various cross checks to see that this actually works for realistic errors. So when I get back is some sort of this slide so what I'm showing you is some sort of a key example of where you see entanglement buildup and, and errors. So this red curve or the gray data is an estimator of the uh, probability that I have made no error in the experiment. It starts close to one and goes down to zero with time. At some point, I will have made an error in experiment. At the same time, the system is just a generic chaotic system. So if you think about the entanglement in the system, it keeps on growing and then saturates to a certain value, that's the maximum entanglement entropy you can have in the system. And this time scale kind of goes up linear and then saturates. So you see this kind of case, okay, so fidelity decay or the probability for errors increases. And at the same time, I'm trying to build entanglement. So here I can make a statement. Okay, in that system, whatever it was, the entanglement goes up and kind of saturates close to maximum level. Close to that maximum level, I have a fidelity of 60%. Okay, with 40, with 60%, I have made no error. So I kind of, Seeing that. So if I go to larger systems now, I would expect this maybe go down faster and then maybe I can build up more entanglement, but it gets harder and harder because my probability to making errors becomes harder, a lot of, larger and larger. Okay. And as the very last slides I want to show you, 30 seconds for <laughs> towards quantum supremacy. Okay, good. <laughs> so what about large scale systems? And you can also ask, okay, if I have so much entanglement at some point, how do you do your classical simulations? At some point, your classical simulation should be out of choose. Okay. So can you compare these things? And this is indeed what we did. It's all preliminary. So we did benchmarking now. This is actually a data set that's a little older. So we now have it up to fully up to 60. So you can do these benchmarking experiments. You get exponential decays that you can measure. You can measure these decay constants. And you see one thing here, I just let's show you that. So this exponential decay constant, this comes back to the first slide. It depends on the system size. So, so if you have say two uncorrelated systems and you calculate the, the error, for, like that's the probability of having no errors, they just multiply. That means that if each of them has exponential, the gamma that you get, it scales linearly because it just adds up in the exponent. That's what's happening. So, and then here you can basically check this many body uh, error rate and it scales as a function of system size. And you see that it's, ah, it's more or less linear. That's at least what we were hoping for. So that means there's no, uh, at least no visible effect of correlated errors, which is uh, completely against what I showed earlier. So that's not obvious at all that it should be like this. It just turns out that all the error sources we have in that chaotic machine, it looks all uncorrelated for whatever reason. We don't know exactly why this is the case, but it's the case, so that's good. So we don't see any nonlinearity, so that's great. Um, you can ask, oh, how did we do the benchmarking? So the issue here is the following. So this is why is this interesting in a sense. So for systems that are larger than 35 in our case, roughly speaking, at late times, you build up so much entanglement that you basically cannot describe that like realistically on a computer anymore. So that's basically, you cannot even store the wave function. So how did we even do the benchmarking here? We do the benchmarking using so-called matrix product states that are basically exact up to a certain time because they only capture a certain amount of entanglement. And then we do short to late time kind of extrapolation. And then we do some cross checks with multiple arrays and splitting them and so on. Um, but without going into details, what I wanna get at is that this gives you a framework for comparing the fidelity that you get in experiment, which is dominated by some experimental errors, okay? And the accuracy you have in simulation. So the point I wanted to make is if I do a classical simulation of that specific experiment for the system sizes that we have, there's no way you can accurately simulate that thing uh, for late times because there's just too much entanglement. So what you can do is you can write down a classical ansatz that captures maybe a certain amount of entanglement. And at some point, the accuracy of that thing will also go down because there's just too many terms in the superposition. 
And this is what's shown here. So this accuracy of some classical algorithm generically would look like this. It's some sort of high up to a certain point and then would go down. And this is when some sort of the entanglement gets too high. The fidelity of the classical algorithm also goes down. And uh, if I take more and more and classical resources, I can make this better and better. Or the other way around, if my classes is resources are small compared to the entanglement, it will just look shitty, basically. That's what it is. So it will be a bad, a bad simulation. And now I can ask, so because when am I actually better experimentally than this classical numerics? This is what I wanted to get at. And just to give you a flavor for this, um, the fidelity we have in 1D for 60 qubit system at the point where we fully entangle everything is 5%. So it might not sound small to you, but if you read some other experiments in this are very, very high, actually. This is maybe order of magnitudes higher than has been done before. So it's extremely high, but it's 1D. So that's the key. But I can still make this comparison. Now I can ask, so how many classical resources do I actually need for this curve to be higher than that curve? That's what I'm trying to do. And this is this. So here's shown. OK, so imagine you have a fixtures experimental line. This is the red one. And then I tune my algorithm, my classical algorithm, and I want it to be better than the experiment. So what, is have to, what do I have to put into the supercomputer basically to be better? And we did this so we're in the process of doing this. Okay, let me skip the one dimension. So there's some control parameter in the algorithm that controls how much entanglement can I build up. So it basically controls uh, how, how high entanglement of a state I can basically map accurately. And this is a so-called bond dimension. So you can see then that the bond dimension I need for the algorithm to be better than the experiment is plotted as a function of n. It's some number. It doesn't tell you much if you've never done a matrix product state, but it turns out to be in the several thousands. And that's actually very, very high. Um, in terms of runtime, it tells you for this n equals system system, you're not completely done, but it takes you about three weeks to run on a supercomputer. This is the MIT supercomputer. Maybe, maybe Yale is faster. I don't know, but uh, this is the MIT supercomputer. Why do we use MIT? Because we have a collaborator, and at MIT, the supercomputing time is for free. And at Caltech, it costs a lot of time, a like lot of money. So that's why we had MIT. Anyway, but the Caltech experiment only takes like, I don't know, maybe half a week, but there's a little bit of an odd comparison we can discuss afterwards, but this is actually uh, crucial. So the point is, this is actually quite expensive. And it's like, if for someone, I'm not sure if someone has done many body physics in 1D, there's always this, this, this some sort of black magic where people say in 1D, many body physics should be easy because you can do matrix product set. But it's only true if you don't build up a lot of entanglement. That's the sort of the counter example. Um, anyway, so there's memory cost. You can do all of that. So the point is, there's significant classical resources you need. They actually have never run this three-week simulation. We extrapolate that. Um, and one thing that's not obvious is here, the classical resources you need, they keep on growing with system size. And that's not obvious because it could be that as you increase the systems, you create so many errors in the experiment that your fidelity goes down so much that you just don't even have to go to higher bond dimension. It's actually also not obvious. There's a result that was somewhat reprising. For example, it couldn't, it's not necessarily such that it takes you longer to simulate a larger system. There's always this grace to go to a lot of qubits and these things. But at some point, it doesn't matter. If you have a lot of errors, the system is crap. Like You have just more crap. Okay, so here it's, it turns out it's not completely true. If I added another 20 qubits, I would still have some sort of a gain. That's some sort of what I, point I'm making. Okay, so what we're going at now is we're trying to do this thing in 2D. So we're trying to do an upgrade. So why do we want to go to 2D? Uh, in 2D, these algorithms are a lot harder. So fundamentally, given the fidelities we, we have here, if we went to 2D, if you talk to the experts, most people would say you have absolutely no chance anymore to do this. But that's what we want to do. So 2D, uh, this would make die at a much smaller point. So some sort of the, the resources would be such that this approximate runtime or the memory, they would go so high, basically, such that I say, okay, you wouldn't want to do this anymore. It's unrealistic to do it. That's some sort of the point. And we believe in 2D, this would be, I don't know how high. We don't know yet, but uh, we believe so high that it should be unrealistic. Okay. That's some sort of where we're going. Okay. Let me summarize. Okay, so I showed you atom by atom assembly in alkali atoms. I showed you a few results for alkaline earth atoms. I showed you a very, very brief overview of this random state generation. It has some kind of fundamental flavor in terms of quantum chaos and agodicity, actually, but it has a practical application for trying to benchmark actually very large scale systems, which you can do here. And that's the key without a lot of control and just benching with a certain like Hamiltonian that has no. Uh, particular single site controller, similar things. Um, let me kind of go back to the original some sort of task. So I hope I convinced you that these tweezer arrays some sort of a forefront platform for quantum simulation, where I believe we are somewhat close to a, yeah, I don't know, um, 
meaningful quantitative statement for quantum advantage. So I think in 2D of fidelities will just be so high. Very optimistic that there's no chance to do simulated systems anymore. I showed you a little bit results for a clock transitions and how we can build atomic clocks. And I think there's a very nice avenue for building a programmable clock where you can have single atoms that have very, very high fidelity or very high Q oscillators to do feedback, but I can now do single atom control and entangle them at the same time and basically play with all kinds of uh, effects of entanglement in terms of how, 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 how good of a feedback I can give to a local oscillator in this case. So what about quantum computing? We had a little bit of a discussion this morning. Um, I didn't show you so much. So there's a few outstanding uh, uh, tasks to really, if you want to build a quantum computer out of this. One is mid-circuit readout. Usually we just read out in the end. So what I need to do for proper quantum computer, I need to be able to read out some sort of in the middle while preserving coherence on the rest of the qubits. And that's something we still have to learn. So there's some ideas for doing this and some very recent progress in Hannes Banyan script, for example, but that's something we still have to get our head around. The other one is to show really high fidelity two qubit gates. I showed you some results for 989 something fidelity, but it was for in a qubit that's in a ground and Rydberg state, but I need to be able to do the same thing in a long lived ground state. So this is something where the fidelity is still 98 ish or so, but in terms of fundamental atomic physics, you should be able to get them high. We just have to do it. I haven't shown it yet. And in the end, we also need to be able to scale up as everyone else. So we need to be able to have a lot of qubits and control them. And that's something we're working on. We think we maybe we can go to 10,000, 20,000, but beyond that, we don't know. So that's sort of where we are. Um, and with this, I would like to uh, acknowledge my group. So a lot of the results I've shown are from Adam Shaw. So if this guy ever graduates and knocks at your door and wants to do a postdoc, I recommend hiring him. He's very good. Uh, and then a bunch of postdocs are building a new experiment and they try to do large scale systems. There's a bunch of theory collaborators, in particular, Sumon Choi at MIT and his student Daniel Mark who did a lot of this randomized uh, benchmarking story with us. Okay, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. We really love it. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the amazing talk. So there were only a few questions. We're running a little bit late. Uh, if you want to push urgent questions. You want to stay and ask and want one. Yeah. So you know there's a large Rydberg Rydberg repulsive interaction. Yeah. If you had zero, well, in particular, if the clock case shows a single photon yeah. absorbed into two Rydberg. But if you do that, um, is there a putting? You had one Rydberg and one clock case, and then yeah, they, 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 I think they actually do that, but the rate is so slow. I have never calculated it. There is, I think, actually a dipole, direct dipole, dipole coupling, but it's so extremely slow that we believe it doesn't matter. But you have a good question. So if I want to build a clock, maybe it matters because everything matters for clocks. So I'm not sure if anyone has calculated that. But, uh, I think it's so small, it shouldn't matter. But I don't want to put my hand into the fire for clock. Junior type clock, yeah. So these anti concentration yeah. Yeah. What does the scale mean? Because, like, if you have a yeah. random matrix theory, you have anti concentration to the eigenvalue of the matrix. Right, right, so right. What's altering the anti concentration? It's a little different. So, the eigenvalue of repulsion, you have to be careful. You're thinking about if you do uh, level statistics, for example, in uh, eigen level statistics. So, this is a little subtle, actually, that one. Um, uh, it's it's not like a yes or no. You just you can quantify, for example, in a sigma or something like that. Yeah. So that's a little. So, uh, I think if it's really agotic, it's a it's a if you do it right, it's a strict exponential up to one over d corrections. The d is the dimension of the Hilbert space. I can show you the math. So you can look at the moments of the distributions, and each of the moments has the moment of an exponential distribution up to a one over d correction. That's that math you can show. It's actually not so hard, but I like it. Even I can do it. Yeah. So this is a T design story. So it's a T design up to one over d. Right. Uh, I was very thankful to Thank you.